The announcement of the armistice was treated with what could only be called suspicious optimism by the Otagos. There was a vast range of different kind of responses. Some relief, obviously, for many soldiers. Uh, disappointment for a few who had only just got there, I suppose. Uh, but the majority was probably kind of indifference, um, disbelief. Yeah, yeah, right, you know, would have been a bit of the attitude uh, because they were naturally sceptical by that time. And, and I think it took quite a while to sink in. It wasn't until they really became troops of occupation in, in southern Germany that um, it finally dawned on them really what had happened. Back in Otago and Southland, the news of peace was welcomed and spontaneous celebrations erupted across the region. There was a strange mix of emotions for many. I think relief was the biggest emotion because it had dragged on for so long. But there was also pleasure uh, in, in that, that it had finally come to an end. Um, but but it, it's, mainly, it's mainly relief and uh, that's a slightly strange emotion. It's, it's, it's kind of deflating rather than than, than anything joyous. So, although, uh, in a way, I think the joy, if it did happen, was when men got, who got back relatively unscathed could be reunited with their families. But that takes a little while before the army is to mobilise. Now, it's not until 1919. So, uh, a lot of the, the, the really positive stuff is kind of delayed. People had been hanging out for the end of the war for ages. And when news began to come through of ceasefires and surrenders on the various battlefronts, Crowds gathered spontaneously to celebrate each one, and when finally the big news came that the armistice had been signed on the 11th of November, the next day, the 12th, the news was here in Dunedin, and again, a huge crowd gathered here in the Octagon, and the Mayor of Dunedin, Mr J.J. Clark, had given so many speeches of farewell and to mark different things from the war, and G up the patriotic enthusiasm. He was here to mark the end, proclaiming the armistice and giving the good news to his citizens who were full of joy and enthusiasm. The Otago spent the first three weeks following the cessation of hostilities recuperating in the Beauvoir area. The previous hundred days had been frantic and costly. Then news arrived that they were now to advance into Germany as part of a temporary force of occupation. Well, I guess they felt that it was necessary to complete the job properly and there was pride taken in that and there certainly was enjoyment uh, in that final phase. In many ways, the New Zealand troops, including the Otagos, got on better with the Germans than they did with the French. It was reasonably pleasant compared to what they'd been through before. I mean, it's a bit awkward. Obviously, there was resentment against them that they wouldn't have enjoyed. But on the whole, they, they seemed to, to get through their, their occupation in Cologne and places like that uh, fairly well. And uh, it was a, a time of, um, uh, well, enjoyment and in inverted commas, but, but it was a lot more enjoyable than what they'd been through. Finally, from early 1919, members of the Otago units began to return home. For some, just a few, it had been nearly five years since they had last seen New Zealand. And so the return home, and here is where for many their journey as soldiers ended at the Dunedin Railway Station platform. So many of the Otago men had left from here, they'd been farewell by family and friends, gone away full of hopes full of anxieties too, I suppose, and now they came back, having survived the war, but carrying scars, whether physical or mental. The years ahead could be tough for many of them, and here is where their new life, back at home, began. Oh, they certainly came home as heroes. I mean, one of the great things about being in the New Zealand, Australian, or, or, or any of the Allied armies was you came home as heroes, as against the other side where you went home as, 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 as beaten men who believed they weren't beaten, which of course is why we have a Second World War in part. Uh, and uh, they were very well received, not necessarily for very long, but, but initially, um, you know, they were extremely well treated and, and everybody was, well not everybody, but the great majority of the population, 80 plus percent probably, uh, had supported the war, 80 plus percent um, welcomed the soldiers home and, 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 and admired what they'd done. They had a new status that they hadn't had before they'd gone away. And if they survived, they'll be unscathed. Uh, it, the experience after the war could often be very positive. They could actually progress in, in business or in their profession or, or whatever they'd left. Uh, of course, if they were injured or wounded um, or suffered psychological damage, the story might be quite different. And, and for a lot of men, you know, the interwar period was really rough. But for some who came through it okay, it was you know, often a, um, 
uh, a good thing to have been a soldier and it, it did did gain you credit whether you're a politician like Gordon Coates or John A. Lee or whether you know you were um, someone more modest but you certainly had an enhanced uh, kudos that, that and mana in the Maori world that, that you didn't have before. With the men returning home it was now time to take stock on the price of victory. The regions the Otagos hailed from had been particularly devastated by wartime casualties. Um, numerically, it, it certainly did in terms of um, the, the the infantry battalion and the Otago Mounted Rifles. The the accumulated total was higher than any other regional body except for the New Zealand Rifle Brigade, Brigade which was a national organisation. So yes, it, 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 proportionally it had it lost more soldiers than any other. Um, so basically yes, it did pay a high price. The Otagos returned home as heroes, but the end game was messy for many of them. Their lives had been forever changed by their foreign experience. In many cases, our veterans' welfare was poorly neglected. There seemed to be much more emphasis on commemorating the people who didn't come home than looking after the ones who did. And the RSA became the stronger for it, so the, the veterans tended to sort of bunch together in, in the association that would understand their needs and their experiences more than the community. How could they? I mean, we're welcoming people back, and we have no experience what they've got, gone through. It's been 12,000 miles away been reported through the filter of newspapers or letters back which have been censored or the I guess the trickle of, of the wounded and the maimed coming back from the front line over those years. So once you get most of the guys coming back who are changed, they'll swear more, they'll drink more, they've probably had VD and recovered from it and most of them will have nightmares for the rest of their lives. I mean it's, it's a really hard thing to welcome back. Hopelessly inadequate, partly because of the scale of the thing. You know, I mean, that's the thing about the First World War: the, the scale of both uh, death and and, and, and uh, injury is unprecedented. No state had ever experienced anything like it, and no one really had much idea of how terrible it was going to be. Uh, so, um, the response was utterly inadequate here, as it was everywhere else around the world. It doesn't matter which country you're talking about, rehabilitation wasn't done very well. When you hear about the rehab soldiers put onto marginal lands in the 20s, that was disastrous. I'm not sure how well we coped with our maimed and wounded soldiers after the war. The limies that were sort of begging on the streets that you hear about. The shell shock cases that would have gone into the Seacliff Hospital and elsewhere. Um, and quite honestly, by the time they come back, in 1920-21 we've got the, the short depression, you know, we've got inflation and then by 1929 we've got the depression and people are too busy trying to feed themselves to worry about what happened in the war. The efforts of those involved in the war were widely commemorated throughout Otago and Southland. But to my knowledge, a lot of the emphasis on New Zealand was putting up memorials to the dead. Memorials were the proper ground for uh, honouring the dead. Um, to see a proliferation of them after the war, for many of them might have been some sort of visible justification for the loss of their friends in the war and the effort they put in. But for just as many, I think that um, especially maybe not so much for soldiers, but maybe for families and wives, fiancés, passing war memorials, particularly in more country areas where the names were on them, might have been um, a bit counterintuitive, might have been a bit hurtful to see the name of your um, fiancé, father, brother, up on a memorial every time you pass. On the one hand, you might have been honoured by the, being there. On the other hand, it might have dug the hurt back into your heart a bit far further. Well there was a book wasn't there about war memorials and it was called The Sorrow and the Pride. I think there was a mixture of that, there was a mi mixture of great grief and, and um, longing for people who weren't coming home and sorrow and that sort of thing. But great pride in, in what they did because they 
unlike a later view, they didn't think that these guys had died in vain. They they knew that they went off to, you know, to fight for New Zealand. And and if you had to die to, to in the process, then so be it. But you know, it was it was worth the effort. Of all of Otago's war memorials, one of the most poignant must be the Soldiers' Memorial on the Otago Peninsula. Standing as if looking out to sea and guarding the city is the figure of a young soldier. The monument itself commemorates all the men who fell from the Peninsula District, but it was made by a Dunedin sculptor, Robert Hosey, whose younger brother, Donald, a brilliant young architect, had been killed in the terrible battle at Passchendaele on the 12th of October 1917. And in making this statue, this memorial, Robert must surely have been thinking of Donald and the tragic loss of life and talent that was involved. You know, I remember the, the, the little piece of Roger Kipling's 1897 poem written for Queen Victoria's time Jubilee, recessional, you know, sort of the high moment of British imperialism, but lest we forget, is, there's a warning in that, isn't there? I mean, it's not, it's not just about, you know, you lot better not forget, but it's, it's also about and don't make the same mistake again. It's kind of implied, and then of course it didn't work because we're the Second World War not very long afterwards. But I think that uh, you know th th there was that uh, sense there, and that's why we have all these memorials all over the place. They're, they're trying to remind us um, that, that something very terrible happened, and, and that uh, we were deeply involved in it, rightly or wrongly, in a way becomes a non-issue. Uh, we were there, and. We did our best, and, and on balance we came about it pretty well. So uh, that mustn't be forgotten, but on the other hand, let's not go there again. There's certainly uh, what sort of shouts out from every single memorial in a way. And here we are in Dunedin's place of remembrance, the Cenotaph. And of all the places we went to on our journey, whether in the Gallipoli campaign, across the Western Front in Palestine, all the men who served and all those who fell are remembered here. And every Anzac Day the crowds gather, increasingly solemn, increasingly packed with young people coming to remember the sacrifices of the generation a hundred years ago. With the passing of a hundred years and the benefit of hindsight, the question has to be asked. What do we make now of Otago's involvement in the Great War? Well, I mean, that's true. My way of looking at it is this, that, that these guys, for whatever reason they went, whether it was adventure, whether it was uh, peer pressure, whether it was a sense of duty, or whether it was to defend the open society, in a sense, it doesn't matter. They were all tipped by fate into uh, the maelstrom, which is the first world war, into a hellish situation, far more awful than anything anyone had ever imagined or experienced uh, before. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it kind of doesn't matter. I mean, they, they were put in this awful situation and they had to cope as best they could. Uh, justified, well, the origins of the war are a bit sort of fuzzy and, you know, probably Germany was slightly more to blame, but the whole of Europe was to blame to some extent. Uh, the whole of European culture was to blame to some extent. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a tricky one, but uh, it happened. Our guys were there and uh, they did their best. And I think that's why the effort should be honoured, but not glorified. I think this is it's a tricky balance here. And so the journey of the Otago, spanning five years and three continents, finally came to an end. What is the legacy today of the wartime exploits of all those brave individuals? Well, I think they have to remember them favourably. I think that, that you know, they were unlucky, um, but that was partly because they were good, and they were, that's why they were so often in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, they will be remembered as an unlucky division, but a very able and, and brave one. The, the legacy is, is what we are and what we've got, um, because if if these guys hadn't gone away to fight a war, hadn't died in the process, if New Zealand as a whole hadn't committed itself to the war, um, maybe things would have turned out differently. And if they had, then Dunedin and Otago would be different places. No one knows what would have happened. But what we all know is what we are, and I think that's the best legacy.
to me that's where you'd start to look at the legacy of the Otago Battalion. What were the battle honours? What did they mean? I don't think even people in Dunedin would look at the street names around Brockville and associate Cockerell Street and Travis Street with World War One. That they, they, they won't know. So I think our legacy is probably one of a mission that, that we just don't know and a hundred years on it's time for us to come to grips with it again and realise that it's easy to dismiss World War I as, as Blackadder, as that horrific sacrifice of people to no end. And I think that denies the fact that the men who served were just like us, flesh and bone, real people, good people. You had your rotters as well, your rotten eggs. And the fact is they were going through circumstances that in this comfortable age we can't even begin to imagine. We, we have no idea what they experienced and I have no idea how they managed to get through it in basically one piece. Um, I think their legacy to us is that what I quote from the history of Gallipoli. You know, I keep saying that the final paragraph in Fred Waite's book talks about the legacy of Gallipoli and it's um, put the interests of community above self. This is what the veterans were saying to New Zealand. Put the interests of community above self. Um, follow in the footsteps of the early pioneers, so build on the legacy that they've been given and help develop the country further. And make New Zealand a sweeter place for the little children. To me, that's the legacy that we actually need to come to grips with. It's something that would make them proud of us.